if I try to say the title, I'm going to get it wrong. And the Global spotlight Peace Studies for Sustainable Developments in Africa. Global, Global Peace, Peace Studies for Sustainable, for sustainable Development, development in, in Africa. Africa. As long as we say it together, it works. And our spotlight's going to be on ONAD. So without further ado, Richard, um, Light, I don't know who Richard is, Light and George. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to Global Peace Studies for Sustainable Development in Africa, where we discuss pertinent issues of peace and sustainability in Africa and across the world. Our speaker today is Professor Howard Richards. And in a few uh, moments, I will just tell you who he is. And some of you, of course, know him. Uh, the title is Two Staggering Facts That Change Everything from Superficial Appearances to Underlying Structural Causes. But that's not going to be happening in this room. That's, that's, right. Mm -hmm. that's right. Now, Howard Richards. Could, could you do that in a half hour? And then we focus yeah, now? yeah, is one of the deepest thinkers of our time. He is a professor, philosopher of social science who is based in Chile and often teaches in South Africa. His focus is philosophical and scientific support for an ethic of care. He holds the title of research professor of philosophy at Elam College, Richmond, Indiana, USA, a Quaker school where he taught for 35 years. He was the founder of the Peace and Global Studies program there and co-founder of the Business and Nonprofit Management Program. <clears throat> so we welcome uh, Professor um, Howard Richards. At 3.30. Right. And now? And now if uh, Light could um, share his thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Uh, and uh, thank you to the participants in this workshop, in this conference, in the international gathering. Um, Light Wilson Agama from South Sudan. And uh, from South Sudan is from an organization of, of nonviolence and development. Organization for nonviolence and development is a nonviolent organization. Okay. Okay. Am I uh, am I on now? Um, I've um, um, but um, uh, to start with, uh, uh, as a premise, uh, peace requires uh, justice, and justice requires uh, an uh, economy that uh, uh, they didn't get it, and I don't know George why it wasn't. Uh, can you hear me? But um, we're going to cut this off and we're going to ask George to leave. I, I think, uh, yeah, can I? Okay, okay. Uh, an economy that satisfies human needs in harmony with nature. Uh, the present economy um, does not do that, and not just because of mistaken public policies or who's in office, but because of that socially and historically constructed uh, basic structure. Uh, those, those of you who are familiar with Theodore Adorno might relate this to the idea of a Tausch Princip, or those who know the work of Andre Orlean to the idea of separation marchand. Uh, it has many names in English, uh, perhaps the uh, most common known as contract. But what I want to do is sort of walk you through uh, the analysis of this, um, uh, what we call an intransitive object of social science, uh, trying to draw out the many different ways in which it changes everything to uh, look at matters in a structural way and uh, practical uh, consequences and uh, guides to action. We want to avoid uh, such 
Well, no, I won't. I won't. But what I'll do is just walk you through the text. That way, I won't. Uh, I won't get myself and you confused by giving you my offhand thoughts. I'll try to give you something that we've uh, given a lot of thought to, and I paid a lot of attention to to every word. Now, uh, next up, uh, now I need to share the screen. Aquí mejor. Bueno, toca stop. Eso, es ahí. Ahí. Sure. Ahí está. So this is a chapter four of my new book with maybe a dozen co-authors, uh, Economic Theory and Community Development. Uh, which uh, is available both in print and Kindle, I uh, used the idea of uh, two staggering facts. That's a, a phrase that uh, pledge, if you sort of think of whatever else is going on, there are sort of at least two elephants in the room that uh, if you're aware of them, given that we're living in a, in a dominant business civilization, in spite of there being thousands of Counter currents, many of them uh, very powerful. Nonetheless, there's a sort of underlying current of history, uh, which um, uh, in Marxist terms is commonly called uh, uh, capital accumulation. Uh, I think I think we can put a little finer edge on it by describing it uh, a little more uh, precisely. So we'll be using that to uh, analyze uh, some uh, in in uh, part, or let's start, uh, a, uh, what, something we call structural humiliation. Structural humiliation draws on the work of uh, Evelyn Lindner uh, and we'll be explaining uh, just exactly what's going on with structural humiliation. Uh, uh, and we'll be working on a text from Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, uh, we will understand John Maynard Keynes as having sort of two basic insights about uh, any economy, meaning any market system. And those are, uh, well, uh, one basic insight is that uh, nothing moves without profit. And the other one is there's a constant uh, uh, shortage or insufficiency of the incentive to invest. People, uh, count on their paycheck to pay their bills and buy their food, but they don't get a paycheck if they don't get a job. And you don't get a job uh, and the sort of what we might call a standard market system, um, unless it's to somebody's economic interest to hire you. And so uh, uh, if we think about the staggering consequences of that, it affects just about everything else that we try to do. Then we'll have a few reflections on social change strategy, uh, rethinking some of the ones that are uh, well known. Uh, and then we'll introduce a few of the novelties in the uh, public employment program in South Africa. Is that is certain, uh, certainly not a solution to anything, but it has certain logical features, which I think uh, help define the future if there's, uh, if there's going to be a future. If we uh, just keep these two staggering facts in mind, then with every, all the other things going on, uh, all of the, uh, uh, in this infinitely complicated world, we'll achieve a pretty good working grasp of how modern society works and how to change it. That's a bold claim, uh, but uh, I, uh, I, I believe it's, uh, it's a bold claim that there for we to make a good case for. And the first fact is that production depends on profit, not entirely, but to the degree that the dominant sector, which is the capitalist sector dominates. The dominant sector doesn't mean the majority sector. Uh, that uh, they, well, the, the, sort, but the sort of standard uh, employment that uh, we read about in economics textbooks is really quite a minority of all the employment there is. Many, many more people work in informal economies than other 
kinds of uh, economies than the one that actually is considered dominant. Uh, but uh, Keynes thought, uh, see, uh, and um, I think a case can be made that uh, uh, is nevertheless dominant. We saw that in Chile in the Allende period. Uh, the, uh, what amazed me most uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a young lawyer who had studied the history of law a lot was that somehow the history of humanity had worked out in such a way that it was considered natural and normal that uh, people could move the means of production from one country to another and there was no national jurisdiction that could uh, deal with it. Uh, the second is that there's a chronic shortfall of effective demand. Uh, in, uh, in more technical terms, uh, what economists call Say's law is not true. Uh, it's also not, and I think that's one of the great blinders that somewhat by accident, uh, because of the phenomenon of stagflation, the uh, sort of overall regime of accumulation of, uh, of a so-called Fortis Keynesian type, or also called social democracy in, in German, it's the social market economy, uh, that was uh, so rather effective after World War II in uh, generating a welfare state. Um, that, uh, it, um, uh, nevertheless, um, uh, it, it, it ran into trouble for reasons that are analyzed in great detail uh, in, a, in a book I wrote with um, Johanna Swanger called The Dilemmas of Social Democracies and then the present book in, also in great detail. So, so if you want to ask what is the, you know, what is the reason for the neoliberal domination of the world today? I think a short answer is that uh, social democracy didn't work. And if it had worked, then the world would be much better off if you, Think, think yourself back to 1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and think of uh, an Iron Bevan calling up John Maynard Keynes and asking him on the phone, well, if we do the National Health Service, are we going to be able to finance it? And uh, Keynes said, okay, go ahead. And, and they did it. Uh, in general, uh, most legislatures pass laws requiring the government to establish full employment. Uh, nowadays, if you listen to the United Nations uh, official spokespeople, they will tell you, well, the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights was about aspirations. We will gradually try to achieve all of these social rights. But I don't think that Eleanor Roosevelt thought that. I think the people writing the Declaration uh, believed in Keynesian economics more than Keynes himself did and thought it was really possible for uh, states to guarantee uh, social rights. But what happened was that fell apart uh, for reasons we analyze in great detail. Uh, and it was something of an accident that um, people who believed in Say's law came to power. What is Say's law? Well, in short, short terms, it says everyone who needs a job will get one. It says anyone who has something to sell will find a buyer, which is not true in any ordinary sense. In fact, it's not true at all. It's been called the most controversial law in economics and there are more than 200 interpretations of exactly what it means. But it's sort of an accident that uh, people who, whose article of faith is that uh, if you just get the government out of the way, the market will clear and everybody will be employed and happy, even though it's obviously not, doesn't correspond to reality. They came to power, uh, but what, they didn't come to power because anybody started to believe that, uh, that they came to power because of, well, for various reasons, which there are various books about, but one of the basic reasons was that uh, social democracy proved unable to uh, resist the uh, forces that were uh, 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 opposed it. Well, the expectations of profit depend on sales. So, so we're back to Adorno's Tausch principle that the, uh, we, we have a society where uh, sales sort of define human relationships. As Marcel Mauss says, we're uh, HMG, we're, we're, we're the modern human being uh, leaves the house in the morning with the wallet in his pocket or her pocket and goes around all day buying things and selling things. And is always thinking, well, I need to get more money. Well, it's true, you need to get more money because that's the way this world works, but it's not the way every world has to work. So Keynes once put it, the weakness of the inducement to invest has always been the economic problem. 
Well, of course, you know, profits depend on sales. Uh, production is moved by profit. There's no guarantee there'll be enough sales to justify a given investment, and much less that there'll be enough sales to produce enough investments to produce full employment, and even less guarantee that there will be employment for those who are no longer counted as unemployed because they've given up and left the workforce, get down and out, and so on. So, so uh, what I'm saying, uh, I think a corollary of what I'm saying is uh, the enormous amount of research done by the World Bank, which has a sign on its headquarters saying we're working for a world without poverty, is mostly misguided uh, because it's mostly about problems of poor people and how to fix poor people so they can sell themselves in the marketplace one way or another. Uh, but, uh, uh, that, but that's not where the problem is. <laughs> the problem is in the structure and the uh, the uh, neo-positivist research methods will never discover that because they just don't think about structures. But uh, if you sort of, uh, like me, you went to Oxford and you had the same tutors that Roy Bask Baskar had, then uh, you can uh, understand that uh, this is never gonna happen because the uh, underlying structures are simply not visible to that kind of uh, social science. They're not visible and they're not looked for either. So in the light of these two, Staggering facts, structural humiliation, the homeostatic nature of capitalism, and the decline of fall of social democracy, and the merits of unbounded organization and uh, economia solidaria, social change strategies, are much more. Much more of this can be uh, understood. So, effective social change. Strategies tomorrow can replace yesterday's ineffective social change strategies. <clears throat> Sometimes in the following chapter, this is chapter four of a 11 chapter book, the first production depends on profit will be called staggering fact one, and the second, a shortfall of demand, staggering fact two. So we claim that in the light of these two staggering facts, much else can be understood. And the reason this is so is there's an underlying reality which can be described in different ways. So, and this I think has a lot to do with intercultural understanding, uh, with the idea of um, uh, discourse coalitions, which is an idea that was founded by, uh, what coined by Catherine Hoppers. Catherine Hoppers uh, uh, is, is in Uganda, but uh, right now she's also an honorary uh, uh, professor at University of South Africa. And um, uh, I, I sort of uh, corresponded with her regarding her um, doctoral thesis. Uh, she was a refugee from Uganda when Idi Amin uh, took power. She had 14 brothers uh, killed. One of them was killed on television by Amin himself. She became a student at the University of uh, Stockholm. Uh, not, and uh, her thesis was on structural violence uh, and uh, African education. And the, uh, uh, in the course of this, part of the structural violence is that African knowledge was disregarded, but that's only a part of it, it was a part of it. And the, um, uh, the, the, the um, what, I, what I'm talking about is the, um, so it's a good thing I'm using this text because I would easily confuse everybody besides myself. I just simply got lost if I didn't have a text. Um, but what I'm trying to I'm trying to get at the underlying point that on um, a critical realist methodology, uh, we distinguish between what's real and how people talk about it. So that immediately demotes uh, European civilization from being the owners of the only way to talk. It uh, makes uh, all traditions, uh, and especially all the ones that survive for some considerable period of time, have some uh, claim on our attention uh, uh, because they have somehow uh, coped with the way, the way things really are. We don't really know all that much. Uh, uh, we can't do it to we know uh, what is. We know, we know the real, but we can have what we call judgmental rationality. We can more be more judgmental than others, and we can have discourse coalitions where people, one, one might be Muslim, another a different kind of Muslim, another a Christian, another one an atheist, uh, who uh, have different mental models, but these mental models should not be confused with the way things really are 
and no, no owner of one mental model should say that, well, you guys are all wrong if you just talk my way. Uh, or we, we should, it's a good tragedy that the school systems, uh, well, for uh, what something that Catherine remembers from her youth was that she went to school and she learned the real names of all the things that she'd known all her life. The real names were names in English named by Europeans, uh, including, uh, you know, mountains and burial grounds that had been sacred to her ancestors for, for, for many years. This is just one example of the idea of a, a discourse coalition. So if uh, we say in our book, uh, Rethinking Thinking, which is published by the University of South Africa, we say in our book uh, that um, the, um, we don't have time to reach a consensus among the world's peoples about the best way to talk about how to achieve world peace and justice. Uh, we, we can say in somehow general terms that peace requires justice and justice requires an economy that functions, uh, but there are other ways of talking about the same thing. Uh, so we, we'll never reach a consensus on just the right way to talk, uh, but we can work together each respecting our own, uh, uh, respecting other people's uh, ways of being, and we can achieve dignity for all, uh, provided that we think of dignity in the terms of the person whose dignity is in question. Uh, we, just, I, think, I think that's reasonably clear. So, uh, so the, uh, the, as we can think of the, uh, the, the real, which can be described in different ways, producing these staggering facts among its observable consequences, as the clashes of tectonic plates produce earthquakes. So one of its names is basic social structure. Uh, I, I'm going to inflict on you also a uh, PowerPoint where the idea of basic social structure uh, is explained in, in, in more detail. Um, so there comes a point when so many facts fit together so well and have so many practical applications that it becomes unreasonable to object that in principle an idea like the basic social structure or the evolution of species might just be arbitrary speculation. I want to add another word about evolution of species. Uh, if we if we're really uh, uh, if we're really uh, loyal Darwinians and we uh, we see the, the the human species as the outcome of, of millions of years of uh, of evolution and selection, then I think that John Dewey was right when he said that the, um, the publishing of, of Darwin's work is, is not really a challenge to religion, it's a challenge to science. Uh, why is it a, a challenge to science? It's because the standard that really determines whether uh, something is valid or not is not so much uh, uh, correspondence to, to facts uh, as it is um, adaption. Uh, the, uh, I, uh, in, my, in another book of mine, the Letters from Quebec, and I, I devote a chapter to the idea of rationality. Uh, how do we define rationality? And I've spilled several pages with short, I have 14 different definitions of rationality. And this, is, this was at one time, sort of the distinction between uh, civilization and culture. The Europeans had rationality. Max Weber, Max Weber says in so many words that rationality was a European uh, discovery. Everyone else didn't have civilization because they didn't have rationality. They only had culture. But uh, with the coming of uh, uh, a Darwinian understanding, uh, we have to understand the brain itself and language itself and thinking itself as um, as um, as ad as adaptations uh, that uh, have made it possible to survive. Uh, we can't make a sharp uh, distinction. And also the history of rationality itself, as the book goes on to show, uh, is a history of many different ideas, many of which are incompatible with, with each other. Um, so uh, when we talk about a basic social structure, we're not talking about the most reasonable way of doing things necessarily. We're talking about the way that does organize people. And that organizing has almost always been mythical and uh, it's a mistake to think of social contract and uh, human rights and other uh, characteristically modern ideas as if they were not myths, if they were somehow like Newton's physics, uh, as, as Kant does. Uh, Kant uh, literally uh, quotes Ulpian's principles of Roman law 
and gives them the status of a priori synthetic truth, as he does also with Newton. So he actually draws in several places in his work uh, a parallel between Newton's laws of physics, which are supposed to be universally applicable, and the basic principles of Roman law, which defined markets uh, as also similarly on the social level, a, um, uh, a um, uh, universal necessary way of thinking. But there's nothing that's universal and necessary, John Dewey points out in his lectures on, uh, on, on the quest for certainty, his Gifford lectures, and also uh, in his essays on, uh, on, on, on Darwin. So what, uh, what an evolutionary principle ends up in the end is uh, multicultural uh, truth that uh, the, uh, the, what we have to respect anything that survived and made it possible for humans to get along and to live with nature uh, which and judged in this category of all the cultures humans have ever created, uh, modern Western European culture is the worst. Why is it the worst? Because it's the only one that is leading life to a term that or the end. No, no other culture has uh, uh, arrived at a situation where the very continuation of the existence, not just of human life, but of life in general, is in question. This wasn't anybody's fault. I'm not saying it was anybody's fault. I think that's a great mistake to think that uh, what we have to do is fight the bad guys today because the bad guys uh, did everything wrong and that's why the rest of us are, 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 are having problems. Uh, I believe that the basic social structures which determine the course of history more than any uh, voluntary activity by human beings uh, were are creations of history and nobody now alive is to blame for them, but we're all victims of history. We're all living in structures we didn't choose, we didn't understand, and they're destroying uh, life as well as uh, civility and, um, and, uh, and peace. But it, so it's unreasonable to object that Karl Popper or Will and Quine, well, let me say what, what is that I'm referring to in Popper and Quine. Uh, there are people who point out uh, and okay. I think you're quite right, that uh, once you know what the outcome is, once you know the world is this way, well, right, right now, you know, just you, once you know that uh, in, inflation is uh, getting out of hand, uh, there's the violence getting out of hand, uh, that uh, the, uh, we're, we're destroying uh, it's, there are seven sort of delicate equilibria that have to be maintained for life to be possible. We've already uh, shattered three of the seven. Uh, once you see all these things uh, about the world around us, you can then make up any theory that will predict the way it is, because you already know what it is. So you can say, well, uh, I postulate uh, class struggle, or I postulate uh, the, the, the will of God, or I, I, I postulate uh, the uh, uh, if market yeah, equilibrium yeah. is the solution to all problems. Yeah. And if we don't have market equilibrium, then everything will go wrong. I postulate the government interference will, as the Leviathan that will lead to another Hitler and another stuff. You can think of any number of theories and predict uh, what's um, going to happen. So this uh, thesis, sometimes called the overdetermination. Uh, of, of theory uh, is, um, uh, I, I want to claim it has its limits. Uh, you can't simply say that um, uh, once uh, that, that you could just choose any theory you want because any theory at all can explain what is actually the case as long as you can deduce from the terms of the theory what is actually the case. That they, uh, this judgmental rationality permits us to get some reasonable handle on what the real really is. If you don't uh, believe me, I think a great cure for the sort of general skepticism is to read the history of astronomy. It is just incredible how, uh, how astronomers have managed to somehow learn things about distant stars uh, when uh, all the 
the principles of scientific method that I learned in elementary school and uh, about how you choose your hypothesis and then you look for the evidence and then you run your statistical test. Uh, that, that's uh, as, uh, as Ram Hare, one of our teachers that used to say, uh, there's really no distinction between the history of science and the methodology of science. The thing that scientists have done has somehow gotten a good handle on things. And they come out, if you understand uh, about where they come out, uh, as, uh, uh, as a, a multicultural world. Okay, so we, 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 we have some good reasons for saying that uh, it tells it like it is to say things like there are two structural facts. That is to say, as we saw very clearly in Chile during the Allende period, uh, when the investors decide not to invest, the economy stops. And they can decide not to invest, not only because it's not profitable, but because they want to bring down the government or for any reason or for, for no reason. So why do we get to humiliation? By humiliation, uh, following uh, Evelyn Lindner, we mean the abasement of pride, which creates mortification or leads to a state of being humbled or lowliness or submission. It's an emotion felt by a person whose social status has just decreased, or we would add, whose low social status has been publicly demonstrated. Now, why do we regard this social status with thinking about humiliation as a valid construct? Um, uh, well, uh, Evelyn Lindner uh, came to this as a result of her research. Uh, and, and her research uh, was, um, I think, uh, all, all of, I think almost all the relevant research was conducted in, in Africa. Of, it was part, part about the uh, genocide in Rwanda, partly about warfare in Somalia, and partly from her private practice as a practicing uh, clinical psychologist in, in Cairo. But the connection with economic theory and uh, to the basic social structure, now uh, let me just underline that. I'm saying that what we call economic theory and basic social structure are really the same thing. Uh, economic theory and economics really is a social structure. It, uh, and a social structure is a way that human beings relate to one another and the way that the sort of dominant way human beings relate to one another in today's uh, globally dominant business civilization is as buyers and sellers. Um, So as things are, it's inevitable there will be people who fail to sell their labor power. Let's say, say, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I was having a great time as a young person. I was dancing, and uh, I said, "Well, not three times on the ceiling if you want me." Uh, and she wanted me, so we have a baby. Okay, now I got to support the baby. Well, how do I support the baby? Well, I get a job. Well. Uh, I've, what I've just been telling you is if you add up the numbers, not everybody is going to get a job. It's, uh, if you add up the numbers uh, in, in markets where the name of the game is to make money, it's not possible for everybody to make money. Well, why is that true? Uh, I think that's an accounting principle. I think in economic methodology, except for some of the modern monetary theorists, uh, I don't think they've given... Uh, it's due to the uh, significance of accounting identities. And, uh, and one of the accounting identities is that total sales equal uh, total purchases. That is every, because every purchase is a sale from the point of view of the uh, vendor and from the point of view of the, of the uh, uh, excuse me, I got that wrong. The purchase is a sale for the vendor and it is um, a, um, yeah, a purchase is sale for the vendor, okay. And for the seller, it's a sale. And for the uh, buyer, it's a purchase. And if you add them all up, they've got to be equal to one another. Well, that means that if there are going to be 100,000 people who are making money, there can be another 100,000 who are going into debt. Uh, that's a, a point that David Graeber illustrates in great historical detail in his history of debt. Points out that every market economy, whether it was capitalist or not capitalist, going back to Mesopotamia, has always had to declare 
uh, a jubilee when debts are canceled, simply because it's of the nature of markets that over time they generate uh, inequality. Um, I think the history of Indonesia, which we discuss in our book, uh, The Dilemmas of Social Democracies, is a good example that uh, in Indonesia at the end of World War II, uh, almost all the assets were held by the Dutch colonists, but at, uh, at the insistence of the United States, which wanted to open the world to American business, the Dutch uh, had to leave Indonesia, which meant that the Indonesians were left with nobody rich. Uh, it was a, a great, uh, uh, it was a country which temporarily uh, had uh, a very low Gini coefficient. But it was inevitable and in fact happened that as time went on, it became a very unequal economy uh, as, as it is today, uh, simply by a process that occurs over and over again. Uh, it's, it's written about in the Bible and other places that uh, over time, uh, the uh, wealth becomes uh, concentrated in, in fewer and fewer hands and Many people become, in many, in many societies, they become slaves because of uh, debt. Uh, but, uh, and the remedy has been uh, in many civilizations that periodically you just have to cancel debts because the system works that way. So, but what's humiliating about this is that people are expected to stand on their own two feet and pay their own way. They're expected to care for their children. They're expected to dress nicely, but to do so, you have to sell something and selling requires buyers. So it's one thing to be willing to work. It's another to find a buyer who will pay you for working. So the basic structure generates people who fail to sell and are therefore uh, humiliated. And this manifests itself in, in many ways, uh, one of which is the American Rust Belt uh, translating into uh, many uh, 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 many uh, people, especially uh, white males who, uh, whose parents or grandparents had good union wage jobs in the industry belt and who now uh, are uh, suffering from depression and, uh, and so many suicides that the uh, USA is one of the few countries, perhaps the only one where life expectancy is going down at this point. Uh, and going down almost entirely because of earlier deaths among the uh, losers in the globalization process. Uh, that doesn't mean, well, but I'm not, I'm not saying that globalization is the cause of the problem in the sense that if we did not have globalization, the economy would work. Globalization was, on the contrary, it was the solution to yesterday's problem. But the, uh, and the point I want to make is there really isn't any solution that doesn't change the basic structure. If, if, you, if you go autarky, if you want to have a self-sufficient economy, you back out of globalization, that doesn't work. You get into globalization, doesn't work either. So globalization is, uh, is not the solution, but anti-globalization isn't the solution either, as long as the, uh, the basic uh, Taos principle remains uh, the way the main organizer of human life on the planet. So our starting point for building the concept of structural humulation will be Keynes economic theory. Uh, what I, I would allege that this could be done with any economic theory uh, by definition. Uh, an, an economic theory, a theory that you couldn't do this with would not count as, uh, as, as an economic theory in the nomenclature that my co-authors and I are, are proposing as a way to think about the world in the book, Economic Theory and Community uh, uh, d d d Development. So uh, let's read um, the initial remarks in the general theory that it talks about the inefficiency and effective demand. And we can read that as, uh, and I think that word as is very important. Uh, there's no seeing without interpretation. There's no reading without interpretation. Uh, in, in, uh, that is in this respect, that social constructivism in, in Heidegger's phenomenology or uh, post phenomenology is right. Uh, that we simply uh, cannot see anything without reading it one way or another. So then we, uh, the, the, uh, 
the, the theory of, we advocate in the book we call unbounded organization and moral realism, uh, that, that can be read as a proposal uh, to see the world uh, as we are recommending. And our book can be seen as a critique of uh, seeing the world as uh, dominant liberal economic theory uh, recommends. And both theories are, uh, are, to, are, to, are tautologies. That is the, the basic structure of the, um, of the science um, is a series of tautologies. And that's not unique to economics. It's true of chemistry. What do you do when you study chemistry? You spend a lot of time you know, learning things that are true by definition. Like if it has so many protons, it's carbon. If you study geology or biology, it's the same thing. You, you learn a lot of definitions and uh, things that over the years, people in the field have found to be convenient ways of talking. Uh, that's not the only way to define physical reality. It's a particular historical tradition, uh, but any other tradition is also going to be an interpretation. It's going to be seeing as, which doesn't mean reality doesn't exist. It does mean something that, uh, that people who saw God in the burning bush understood long ago, that we humans uh, are not really the uh, masters of the earth who uh, somehow define what it is, that we are more defined by than definers of, uh, of the realities that we need to uh, cope with if we're going to survive. So such an account, the basic facts of life and society is ruled main, mainly by markets. See, I've got to say society is not run only by markets. Uh, uh, Keynes himself apologized for at, at one point for choosing a minority phenomenon, which is investors creating jobs as if it were uh, the general case. Uh, but even though it's not uh, as uh, it's not so much the general case as uh, some economists might think, uh, uh, people like Gary Becker who apply economic reasoning to everything, whatever in life, um, it nevertheless uh, uh, is a good starting point when you want to ask the question: Where is the power? And how can we turn things around so that we can speak truth to power and, and change the world? So, uh, Bhaskar wrote that the mass unemployment of the 1930s was the motor for Keynes' demonstration of the theoretical possibility of market equilibrium with unemployment. So why, why would Bhaskar make that remark? And why did Keynes need a motor? Well, Keynes explains that himself in the, in the preface. And that is that the standard uh, uh, English uh, curriculum in economics uh, was so logically perfect. And that still, if you ever had occasion to debate with a neoliberal, uh, really, uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, skillful neoliberal, you probably, you'll know what I mean, that there's always an answer to the question. Uh, if, if things don't turn out the way the neoliberals predict, well, they, they, they really predicted it, but it, uh, there's always a, there's a, the, uh, as, as Keynes remarks in his preface, the difficulty is not so much the new ideas, but breaking through the old ideas, and the old ideas will provide a, uh, a conceptual system uh, such that there's no evidence, you can't come up with one crucial experiment which will defeat or even, even very many. Thomas Kuhn makes the same remarks about uh, in his history of scientific revolutions that scientific revolutions don't have, don't happen uh, usually uh, when new facts make the old theories untenable because there's always a way to tweak the facts, to tweak the theory, uh, to massage the data, to save the theory. Uh, the, one of the most shameless people in this respect is Milton Friedman, who simply uh, gives himself a license to say, well, we don't need uh, 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 realistic premises to have a valid prediction. And they doesn't have valid predictions either, but that doesn't uh, stop him from, uh, from you know, and Kuhn's remarks that uh, you know, great scientific revolutions usually happen when the old generation dies off and the younger generation is more persuaded for something that, uh, well, so, um, so, uh, so the theory that already existed uh, when Keynes uh, was um, an, uh, first uh, studying uh, uh, and, and uh, that had been developed by people like uh, 
uh, Kane's own father and by Pepeau and by Marshall. Uh, this, this theory was so self-contained and so self-referential that any facts whatever uh, could be uh, fitted into it without refuting uh, the theory. But there, there's a limit to this. You can only go so far. And when you have a theory that says unemployment is impossible, it doesn't exist, and then you have, you look outside your window and you see thousands of unemployed people who are marching in protest and you see the masses of Italy rising up and electing a fascist dictator and the same thing happening in Germany and the wars, all of this, you see the world breaking down when the best of all possible worlds was supposed to have been created by a century of liberal economics, then that's a motor. It's a motor to think uh, it right. It's just possible that there could be unemployment uh, at so-called market equilibrium. Of course, market equilibrium has never occurred either. It's, it's always been an imaginary idea. Um, and But being imaginary, it doesn't stop economists from using it as a standard for judging the real economy. So mass unemployment was big. It was structural. Uh, we tend to use the word structural when we refer to something big and not something small. It was happening outside the range of phenomena that classical economics was prepared to see. So ontology, what is, intruded on epistemology. It forcibly reminded scholars of Heidegger's point that ontology should determine epistemology. That is, what is should determine how we study it, how we think about it. We shouldn't do it the other way around. So epistemology determines ontology. Perhaps one of the most, uh, 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 what's what called egregious uh, arguments that uh, tend to make uh, epistemology determine ontology is found in the logical positivists where they would sort of uh, def define as meaningful only something that uh, fitted, uh, that for, as, as Rudolf uh, Carnap put it, science is a relationship among descriptions, which means that we describe one variable this way, another variable that way, and the relationship between the variables is that one depends on another statistically or even better uh, linearly. Uh, and then we say, um, that um, uh, it, uh, scientific truth depends on the regularity of the evidence being as we describe it uh, in several ways. But, um, but this, uh, so for a realist, uh, this can't be true. This has got to be a human way of talking that is really failing to sort of grasp the underlying causal mechanisms that are generating uh, they observed uh, phenomena. So uh, Keynes sees the defective lenses as framed by Say's law. The law, which I uh, already mentioned a bit, um, I'm going to skip over this. Uh, so that uh, people won't buy is of critical importance. I'm going to skip on this too, because I think I'm running out of time. I, um, so, so here's a point to mention. Uh, the individualist ethical centerpiece and the ineradicable economic phenomena later spread from Europe to the globe and from the 18th century until now. That is, the, a human person was defined, uh, quoting Rousseau, as born free. And this implies that markets crash in periodic crises. Why? Because people don't have uh, ways of acting uh, that could go on for hundreds of years, uh, as in, uh, uh, for example, there are cases where we, we know that some uh, tribal peoples have exchanged uh, with one another. Uh, for example, what, one of the examples is um, in, the, in, in the Western Pacific, uh, there are people who live inland and produce uh, gardening crops and others live on the coast and uh, do fishing, and they meet periodically at the beach, <laughs> and they go through ceremonies of uh, ceremonial relations with one another, and one and the fisher people walk off with goods from the soil, and the people who produce goods from the soil walk off with fish, and this can go on forever. It's a ceremonial process of, uh, of, uh, of ceremonial brotherhood and cooperation among uh, peoples who are related by 
uh, by, by kinship ties, and there's no reason it can stop. It's like uh, here on the Imachi, I have lemon trees. My neighbor has grapes and makes uh, chicha. Uh, I get, every year I give him lemons, he gives me chicha, and there's no reason it's gonna stop. But when we introduce money, uh, then somebody's got to make a profit. And if somebody's make a profit, someone's got to run a loss. So the situation is uh, fundamentally unstable. I think we can understand that at this basic level, and then if we read uh, Hyman Minsky's book on uh, trying to stabilize an unstable economy, and Hyman Minsk goes through all the ways that people um, I've tried to sort of get the formula so there'll be no more inflation, no more depression, no more unemployment. Somehow we got to get this formula right. And uh, Minsk is right. It's, they're never going to get it right. Uh, Michael Kolecki makes a very similar point. You'll never get it right because it's inherent in the basic uh, uh, basic structure that you started with. You started with a structure that's not my problem. It's your problem. Go away. Uh, and, now, and once people have this attitude, uh, uh, it, uh, it, it, it can't work. So while acquiring the physical necessity of life and keeping the economic machine going depends on sales, cash sales are never enough. Why? Because sellers need to sell while buyers are, not, are free not to buy and often do not buy. There must be credit and always more credit. I know this more than most people because I practice as a bankruptcy attorney and I uh, deal with uh, debt counseling. So ever increasing debt is needed to get things done that need to be done. And that implies sooner or later, debts must become unpayable. So the emancipated juridical subject capable of owning property and contracts too far. So it's like CNN, the two cats belong to Aunt Sarah. They're Siamese if you please and here, the, and this, if you don't, please. So homo economics is free to buy and free to sell and therefore free not to buy. And therefore people who need to sell their labor power or something, uh, somebody's gonna be left out. And uh, so uh, we agree with Keynes uh, and also other uh, economists that once the assumption that there will be a buyer for your seller collapse, everything else changes. Economic theory changes, common sense changes, and the expectation of poverty can be cured by educating the poor changes. So uh, you can say this is really a, uh, another way of looking at this is to think in terms of the end of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, when apartheid was going on, uh, it was very, I see as far as, as I can read the literature, it seemed to me that everybody, Nobody questioned the idea that the reason the blacks are poor is that the whites are rich. And when we end apartheid, everybody's gonna be rich. Everybody's gonna be like the whites. But this is never true. Uh, and if ever, and the, uh, uh, at a certain point, Nelson Mandela uh, believed in what he learned uh, in, in his childhood, living uh, with different African principles. Uh, but then uh, when he emerged from jail, he had uh, a uh, uh, socialist intentions, uh, but of course, and, but what happened? He almost immediately uh, became part of the World Economic Forum. He invited the World Economic Forum to meet in South Africa. He gave the keynote speech, uh, Trevor Manuel, Thabo Mageki, uh, virtually all of the major decision makers uh, in uh, post apartheid South Africa were participating actively in the uh, World Economic Forum activities and research and ideology. Uh, so uh, that, um, that, that changed everything. Uh, once you uh, uh, bought into that, uh, it became uh, inevitable that good intentions could not be trusted into realities. Nobody has better intentions than Klaus Schwab, at least as you, Klaus Schwab is the founder of the forum, as you probably know. Uh, as, as you probably know, the, the, the forum is in favor of ending poverty, peace, stability, human rights, uh, social entrepreneurship, and so on. But it also is committed to the idea that the means for achieving these things are uh, investment, free trade, freedom of capital movement. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that, that, that will never, 
never happen. And so what, that's what I mean, and all else changes. Uh, all else changes in the sense that if you have been believing that uh, the uh, dominant mode of thinking uh, uh, found in not, not just in the world economic form, but there are also African and every region of the world has its own uh, parts of this. Uh, in this, uh, it, it can't possibly be true. You cannot educate the poor out of poverty by uh, providing s skills that give There will always be skills. Uh, something else, and they do not work. So, financial crashes can be cured by regulation or sound money policy. from Bank. These are saying, uh, I might mention that uh, this not the theoretical fourth chapter is followed by the fifth chapter, which is very empirical. It gives a very detailed examination of the attempt to cure poverty in South Africa in the first 20 years of apartheid. And I think as everybody knows uh, at this point in history, the number of wealthy black people is a little bit higher than the number of wealthy white people in South Africa, but the great mass are living in poverty and in many cases worse than it was under apartheid. Well, how could this possibly happen? Well, it didn't happen. It happened because the basic theoretical premises are mistaken. They simply cannot uh, uh, get out of structural humiliation uh, using. Uh, economic theory, and uh, we, are, we argue of any kind. You simply have to make community where it starts, and you have to harness economics to community instead of, uh, instead of the other way around. So once classical economics is granted its premise that the chronic shortage of buyers found in the real world does not exist, all the rest follows the social advantages of thrift the traditional attitude towards the rate of interest, the classical theory of unemployment. The classical theory of unemployment was that employment, unemployment is a matter of bargaining between the worker and the employer. Uh, the, and the, this is Pigou's theory that Keynes is writing against. Supposedly, the employer bargains with the worker, the worker refuses to work unless he pays the wage that the worker is happy with, and that's how you determine the wage. Uh, but that's not what happens. What happens is, uh, on, on Keynes' account, uh, the, uh, first the employers calculate what the sales will be, and when they uh, can predict for some confidence what they'll be able to sell and at what price, then they decide how many people to hire. So hiring takes place behind the, the, the amount of people hired is not a bargaining process uh, in reality between the worker. It's a case of uh, there being an enormous oversupply of people who need to work in order to be responsible parents able to raise their kids uh, who pretty much have to take whatever is offered and whatever is offered is never going to be enough uh, because there aren't sales enough to make profits enough to make it profitable to hire everybody. Uh, but Keynes uh, did not really grasp uh, the significance of what he was saying. Uh, I'll leave that some. Uh, uh, that is to say, uh, Keynes sort of got to the point where he saw something, but he didn't get to the uh, underlying uh, uh, structures that um, that need to be understood to make uh, the uh, the real change at the level of basic human relationships. So now I want to make a few remarks about uh, social change strategy. Um, in today's world, the amount of information available is so huge that nobody can assimilate it. So. Uh, so traditional general worldviews providing overall orientation are hard, are hard to believe. As uh, 
people say, well, um, the people tend to be generally skeptical. Uh, what one thing they've learned from history is that nothing works. So, uh, politicians are blaming this. Their politicians promise things and then they don't keep the promises. So it's the politics' fault. There are many people I think who will believe that corruption is the only problem. The system would work if only people weren't corrupt. There have been, recently been a number of presidential campaigns in several countries where the candidate has said, uh, the economy would work perfectly well if it weren't for corruption. And when I'm elected, there'll be no corruption and therefore the economy will work. The investments will flow in, there'll be jobs for everybody. It's all gonna work uh, once we put these guys in jail who've been siphoning off money from the public purse and putting it in their own pockets. But this can't, can't, uh, can't possibly be true. And, and there's another problem too, and that is uh, when uh, people uh, engage in belief systems, uh, many people want to uh, sort of not believe in anything because anybody who believes in anything tends to become a fanatic. They, uh, people say, well, I'm a, I'm a true Christian. Well, the problem with being a true Christian is that you're anti-Muslim and then you're anti-atheist and you're anti-everybody else. Well, that's, everybody knows that wasn't what Jesus had in mind. Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad didn't have it in mind either. <laughs> Almost all religions tend to uh, sort of prey on weaknesses in human nature and people can uh, have a general mind. And the other way around too, people, uh, people like me who sort of practice a religion and uh, uh, really, really take a, a we really take a, a sort of a idea of trying to deal with one's, one's own inner devils as a way of uh, making uh, a purity of heart. Uh, these uh, we, we can easily believe that the problem with the world is, is sin. That if people weren't sinning all the time, if you read, for example, in the Catholic religion, the seven deadly sins. If you ever read the seven deadly sins, uh, just try to imagine a world in which everybody tried to avoid the seven deadly sins. It would completely differ from our world. Our world is uh, organized according to practicing every one of the seven deadly sins. That's what marketing is for, is to make people buy more than they need, eat more than they need, uh, uh, take uh, vacations instead of uh, working. Uh, I think it's worth remembering that the seven deadly sins were defined by Pope Gregory the Great in 695 at a time in history rather similar to our own. When there was a pandemic going on, there were incessant wars, and uh, it, they, uh, it was a way of uh, organizing life so that there would be more food and uh, fewer uh, children to, to feed, and the people who did eat wouldn't eat more than they needed. It was said that Pope Gregory would not eat himself until everyone else in Rome had, had eaten. So there's a lot of... Um, so uh, this, this is what, what I'm trying to make my case for unbounded organization in the sense that... Uh, uh, we need to all work together uh, because we're up against the clock to try to save life from extinction. Uh, and we, we can't afford to rule anybody out of the game just because they don't think the way we do. On the other hand, we have to be realists. There is a, a bottom line. Uh, and if uh, you keep dumping poison into the river, no matter what you might think is happening, the river is dying and the fish are dying and the, uh, the environment is dying. So we call, uh, we, we, we call it, we summarize the philosophy we advocate in this book as unbounded organizing and uh, moral realism. So, so this illustrates why bounded thinking connected to moral liberalism leads to ineffective social change strategies. Um, they, they show why unbounded thinking the principle to align across sectors for the common good and see that the possible solution is imminent. Um, I have, you might wonder, well, well, this is a big critique of liberalism. Well, what about socialism? What about Marxism? Uh, what does that fit into the picture? I don't have time to say anything, but I'll, I'll share with you by mail uh, a recent uh, editorial I wrote uh, claiming it's time to uh, transcend the uh, the socialist versus capitalist uh, way, way, way of thinking about things that there's uh, uh, there's a way of uh, understanding things that um, it's not a consensus model in the sense that we're not 
saying that there's no struggle of the economic interests involved, but we are saying uh, that when we realize the uh, uh, consequences of um, of conflict, when the, the sort of the depth of the conflicts of interest going on in the world, they show you that uh, it's really much better to seek consensus uh, simply because the world is full of conflicts and not to deny the conflicts, but to uh, uh, seek consensus as a, as a path to peace um, because um, constructive work uh, provides a solution. So it would not be realist if we did not acknowledge that human cultures and civilization are founded on custom, ceremony, the interest of the stronghold, ritual story, and so on, more than on facts. Rather, the realist, naturalist, pragmatist philosopher, John Dewey, we treat all institutions, regardless of the problems, as hypotheses to be cautiously and carefully evaluated in the light of their performance. So, a realist worldview sees culture as the ecological niche of the human species that concurs with the anthropologist Boggs. So there has to be community in an important sense before there can be human action. One uh, concept we invent in our earlier book, The Dilemmas of Social Democracies, is the idea of cultural resources. What is a cultural resource? A cultural resource uh, is, is a practice and belief that, that, that makes it possible for people to cooperate and work together to solve their problems. So if I, 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 we, uh, we're working in a community, we find out that everybody who lives in this community are Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they've all, we, we ourselves, let's say, for example, we are African Renaissance people and we want to uh, revive traditional African culture. And that's great, but then suddenly we show up with these people. We, the, 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 uh, we, we wish they the, the way we do, but they don't. They're Jehovah's Witnesses or these other. Uh, well, we accept we have a, a cultural resource here. For, and it works for them. That's the that's the starting point for working for them. Uh, and um, we can't really wait until everybody. Uh, talk the same language uh, 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 we do. Uh, and one of the great tragedies of the modern world uh, is that so many cultural resources have been uh, undermined or dissolved. There, there are so, so few uh, 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 remaining um, ways of socializing young people to work together for the, for the good of, of the whole, that we have to work with the ones there are. A universal human rights, it must be uh, said, has to be taught. It's not something that there's an instinct for, a tendency. Uh, I, I have a, we have a student at the Graduate School of Business in, um, in Cape Town who wrote in one of her papers that, uh, I went to visit my grandmother. My grandmother lives in the country and my grandmother said, you know, I can't imagine why you would trust anybody who was not of your own tribe. And, um, and well, who's the normal person here? Well, a normal human being, uh, unfortunately, uh, has a uh, wired in genetic tendency. I'm summarizing lots of evidence. I hope you'll forgive me my uh, oversimplifications. A tendency to, be, to want to be a good person. In, in Lawrence Kohlberg terms, uh, or Piaget's terms, uh, normal human reality is uh, growing up to learn the uh, the codes, the way of the, the moral codes of the group that you belong to and you are born in. That that's something that humans have been doing for thousands of years, and normal people have a normal commitment to normal morality in their milieu, but. People do not have a normal tendency to uh, believe in universal human rights. That all humans, regardless of, of creed or race, have certain basic rights. And that is a, that is a very good idea. Normal human rights are a very good idea, but they've got to be learned. As peace educators, we have to educate for human rights because we can't expect them to be spontaneously. Uh, you know. Now, I know that's to the contrary, but I think the uh, the argument for 
kila siku kutoka siku tunakuja hatuwajui hata majirani mambo haya vipi sana usiku baba kila siku 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 kila siku siku hadi dereva katika nyumba kwangu so always this um Thank you in fact in mind that an effective social strategy must be under the uh, driving force of the economy. Hector, please mute yourself. Hector, please mute yourself. Well, we have to do and uh, this is uh Unfortunately, this is where Julius Nyerere sort of got caught because uh, he realized he needed loans from the International Monetary Fund to keep the driving force of the economy going. He didn't really believe in it. He did it against his will. Uh, and then uh, the chickens came home. To our, we, we have to somehow learn from his from an enormous wisdom but still we, we still have the problem that if the world is going to work at all it's going to work because we break free of, re, of relying on investor confidence to create a daily that keeps life going which never works for everybody but when it doesn't work at all uh, it can be worse we have to wean ourselves away from it with other ways of doing things. Uh, there are many other ways of doing things. Uh, we, 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 we talk about, a, we, we need a transition to a solidarity ethics. Uh, uh, it has to uh, reframe as to achieve solidarity. Uh, that's, that's sort of the achievement uh, for economic theory for a sustainable, it's not an agenda that's instantly accomplished. And it's a very uh, difficult decision to what extent uh, you're going to uh, keep the existing system going because an immediate breakdown uh, makes things worse instead of better. And you may imagine that you know when the capitalist system collapses, suddenly the working class will arise and produce uh, ideal socialism. But that's not what actually happens. What actually happens is that there's a, a military coup, and they uh, they throw people in jail, uh, and we, we we revert to fascism when we arrive at chaos. So sort of the peacemaking task, I think, to a large extent can be described as combining the pedagogy of the oppressed with the pedagogy of the non-oppressed to make the people who are uh, in a position to, um, to uh, use resources for the common good, uh, realize that they're shooting themselves in the foot by keeping the people down. But they don't always realize this very fast, fast enough uh, to, or, 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 or clearly enough. I, I'm speaking in sort of a muddle here, but I, I think the general principle is pretty understandable. That we, we, an effective social change strategy uh, will not uh, shut the world down and expect it to be instant, instantly rebuilt. That's, that's not going to happen, but we do need to work with existing cultural resources and, and not destroy them. Well, I think that was sort of a classic error of the Marxist regime in Ethiopia, that they were so confident in that with the Marxist uh, uh, cultural strategy that they thought they didn't need the uh, already existing cultural resources. Uh, dear, dear Howard, uh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, I'm so sorry for, for cutting your, your uh, speech, but uh, Actually, we used to allow the participants to give you some uh, some questions, and uh, perhaps we can use the last ten minutes to do that. Okay, mm -hmm. I can. But I, I'm so sorry. Uh, perhaps no, you want to finish. You finish your speech with with uh, one or two sentences. But it would be very fun if our participants could ask you short short questions, and you can give short answers. Okay. Sorry, I'm so sorry for that. I can stop talking now, uh, and I'll look on the chat and see if I can uh, find some uh, uh, 
question I can read because I really can't make out what people talk. So I'll stop talking and look at chat and see if there's a, a question. Is oh, oh I think, uh, Howard, I think in, in this chat you will not find any questions. Um, there are, uh, it depends on, on, on uh, microphones, uh, didn't, didn't mute it and so on. We, we should wait for, for questions by the participants. Well, I'll start. I'll start. This is, uh, I, I've, Howard, I've been following your work for years and I always find you so stimulating. Really appreciate your contributions. And you all, you always bring us something new, right? And, um, and, and, and I was, I was thinking your, your one comment, I, I don't remember exactly how you said it, but something like we have now we have so much information we're overwhelmed and I and I feel that way about your presentation. Um, there there are so many there are so many directions to go. One one thing I, I I would like you to say more about you started talking about it toward the end is um, okay how do we change the structure what 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 are your thoughts about the best ways we can uh, begin to to dismantle, reconstruct, and so on. Okay, I think the question is how do we uh, how do we change the structure? Uh, I think you should have um, a, a short bibliography on uh, unbounded organization, uh, in which um, I, I've I've done a lot of work. I've thought a lot of work. Uh, you're telling me I have too much information overload. We can't deal with all this all at once. And then you're asking for more information overload because you want to know all my recommendations and all the work I've ever done to actually realize social change. But I will tell you, I've done some social change. Uh, for, for one thing, I was the lawyer for the Cesar Chavez's farm worker movement. And one of the things that we pulled off was a major wage, wage raise for uh, several million workers in the sugar beet industry. Uh, and once that happened, I said to myself, I can no longer believe that uh, nothing I do can ever make a difference because that was one case where it did make a difference. So uh, we have a great deal to say about social change. And in, in the uh, Springer Handbook on uh, Building Cultures of Peace, uh, my co-author and I have a chapter called A Practical Method with a Theoretical Basis on how to build uh, cultures of peace. So uh, I can't say everything at once. I try to say everything at once, uh, but, but it can't be done. And, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, but uh, anyway, what, as a general principle, I'm uh, in favor of con more consensual and less confrontational, uh, nonviolent uh, uh, change, but particularly change that works on the, uh, the basic principle of the system. That's also in the PowerPoint to show you that we, we actually be the change we want to see. And that means uh, that we believe that people should share surplus. We believe that all the 1% the should be sharing this 1%. They shouldn't be stashing it away in, in, in fiscal paradises. They should be using it preferentially to create dignified livelihoods. I myself am creating dignified livelihoods in the neighborhood where I live in Chile by creating people working on um, environmental issues. The, the, the one thing that human beings must do at this point in history, if there's nothing else, is make peace with nature. But nature's not gonna pay you to make peace with it. Where is your salary gonna come from if you're gonna to work to make peace with nature. Well, it's gonna come from people like me whose income is greater than their expenses or for people who have uh, from, from anywhere where there's a surplus. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says this very clearly, whatever you own you don't need belongs to other people you can help. But it's not just the people you can help, it's mother nature you can help at this point in history. And you yeah. can, well, for what we're doing here, for example, we're planting native trees, uh, we're teaching little kids in school how to do organic gardening. Uh, we're keeping bees. We're, uh, we're uh, uh, creating bird refuges. And, and, and the people uh, have dignity 
uh, working. Uh, I, and now that you ask, I'm going to, well, blah, blah, blah. I, I'll stop talking. Thank you. George, are you back as our moderator? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. And sorry for coming in late. And uh, it has been a wonderful presentation. I've been following from quite some time. Uh, uh, Richard's, uh, Howard Richard's uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sorry that there was also background noise that I couldn't control, unfortunately. Uh, but now we have about uh, five minutes. If we could probably have one more question or comment, and then we'll ask our speaker for today just to make a concluding uh, remark. Thank you. So how you can see Joe uh, raised his hand. All right, Joe, Thank please you. go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I just I just wanted to ask real quick um, about you know the theories like the economic theories. A lot of them are old. I'm wondering what you how you try to bridge them to the current to like to 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 today. Because I'm thinking about things like concepts of unemployment. How how much? do you factor in the creativity of the individual today? Uh, because there's a whole economy of people who would, for, who would be classified as uh, unemployed, but um, are finding creative ways to make money on the ground. So it's like, I'm wondering, are the, uh, how, are we, how are we making sure that the theories are keeping in touch with evolution? Yes. How are, did you get the question? Can you hear us? I think it would be a good idea. Um, see, am I muted or not? I don't know. Now I hear you. You are not muted. You're okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think it'd be a good idea if I didn't say anything, but just listen to other people talk uh, and uh, took some notes and maybe sent a memo afterwards. Uh, I think other people should be uh, talking and I've talked enough. All right. Did you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So we will actually share with you with the rest um, any memos or um, notes that uh, Howard will share with us. It has been a pleasure having you, Howard. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And I'd like to thank everybody also for their time and their interest. I am greeting you from Juba, South Sudan, where we have just uh, ended a conference on the African Peace Research uh, Association matters. And now there is uh, an international meeting going on that I'm also attending in the same place in, in Juba. And some of our colleagues are here who have been also taking part in our global peace studies for sustainable development in Africa. For example, Matt Meyer, and he remembers you very well, Howard. He wished to be here, but is also attending a different uh, program now that is uh, going on concurrently. And of course, uh, Benedict Muthien is also here and uh, David Omona and Stellan Windhagen. Some of these people have spoken at the webinar before. And, uh, and so it has been wonderful also interacting with them. And uh, I'd like to welcome you again uh, next week, where we'll have a book launch on elections by two fellows, um, Elias Opongo in Kenya 
and Tim Murithi in South Africa. So we'll be meeting at the same time and we are using the same link. Thank you very much indeed for joining Global Peace today. I wish you all the best. Goodbye. Thank you.